We have live in a culture where we feel if we can use our personality and our gifting to manipulate others to get our way, we can gain advantage. But I believe the greatest advantage any human can learn from the time we're small is that reverence will never fail us. And so reverence and repentance, responsibility and accountability walk hand in hand. Amen? You may be seated for the reading of the Holy Scriptures. Good morning. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 6. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out of by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Today's epistle is from Romans 8. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. So these first, the first part of these verses talks about where's our minds. Really, that's our daily battle, this between our ears. So what's going on with our minds? thoughts. I pulled up on the internet. Uh, I just asked the question, how many thoughts does an average person have every day? I found one that had medical in it, and I thought that'll be a good one. It said we have 60,000 thoughts a day. But the interesting thing was 80% of those thoughts are negative. Our experiences, things that happen to us when we're children, affect our adulthood. I know when I was about 12, 
Uh, I went to a, Catholic, a small Catholic school, and the popular and cute girls formed a cheerleading squad. Well, probably in probably the boldest move I've ever made, I decided I was going to do it too. So I got my uniform together, went to him and said, I'm going to be a cheerleader too. While being a Catholic school, what could they do? They said, okay. <laughs> I lasted one game. I think I maybe made it through that game. I'm not sure. It was the worst experience of my life. And I think what it did to me is it, it held me back from that boldness that, that God wants us to have. And I thought something as trivial as that in my life, you think of people that have had really bad things happen in their childhood, you know that it, it affects the adulthood, it affects our belief systems. And what we've been taught by parents, by teachers, by just friends, these all form what we believe about ourselves, about life, about God. But this, in these next few verses, I love it when the, the word says, but you, because we know God's talking directly to us, to his church. God sees us in the spirit, and his filter when he sees us is the blood of Jesus. In these verses, we're, we're reminded that God's spirit is within us, working righteousness and life. But it also reminds us to keep our mind on God. So what's our responsibility from these verses? Change our mind, repent. For the times we let our minds go back to what we believed before we became a Christian. When we let our minds go back to it's all about me, 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 me. When we forget to see how God sees us. Instead, every day, we have the re responsibility of putting on the mind of Christ. Remember, God is at work in each one of us, and it's a good work. We also need to believe and trust the Holy Spirit. Allow him to work and work with him. Because he will bring us to maturity, righteousness, and true life. This is the word of the Lord. Grace and peace be with you all. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fifth Sunday in Lent, the feast of St. Mary of Egypt. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness is not unto death. It is for the glory of God. Everybody say, God sees things differently. So that the Son of God may be glorified by means of it. Now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, let us go into Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were but now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Thus he spoke, and then he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him out of sleep. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Say, God sees things differently. God 
as these things things to come. And now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. This is the word of the Lord. Happy are they who hear these words, believe them, and obey them. Praise Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, speak to us today. Enlighten us, empower us, encourage us. Extract us from the carnal influence of this world that we may die like Lazarus to the natural things and be resurrected, that we all may go to that tomb, as St. Thomas said, and die with him. For we know, Lord, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the God of resurrection, the God of renewal. And Lord, resurrect us again and again through our baptism, as we walk on this earth. For your glory, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Children are now dismissed. It was quite a story, wasn't it? True story. Quite a true story. I am... was thinking about Mary of Egypt, St. Mary. Do you think she had reverence for the things of God, even when she was living a life of debauchery? There's something about reverence, a feeling of attitude of deep respect that is housed in awe and veneration an outward manifestation is to pay reverence deep respect you know what we're taught in our culture I'll only respect what I agree with I'll respect my husband if he if I agree with him I'll respect my government if I agree with it I'll respect my leader if I agree with them which is a form of idolatry to say I will only respect what I'm comfortable with and what I agree with. This is why a lot of people today never make it anywhere in life because they have this don't tell me what to do, don't tell me how to live attitude. But yet when you look at their life, when you look at their state of being it has no peace or joy in it in fact a lot of the rebellion in our young people today towards authority towards parents towards the towards the government towards uh, uh, law enforcement towards everything is one of the reasons that our divorce rate and and our our ability to stay with something any length of time is so short. Because the minute that we have to respect and reverence outside of our emotions, we don't know what to do. Because we have become an idolatrous people. Do you think that Mary reverenced Abazosimus? She reverenced him. She reverenced the resurrection, because 
inside of each one of us, created in the image and likeness of God, is a need to feel pure. And the need to feel, feel, uh, feel pure gives birth to repentance. Now here's what the problem is. Repentance is the fruit of reverence. If I do not teach my children to repent and reverence, they will become comfortable with feeling impure. And when I become comfortable with feeling impure, when I become comfortable with that, then I become hostile towards anything that requires respect. And it's filtered into the church. It's filtered everywhere. It's, you know, I will make vows and break vows based on how I feel. Because surely God isn't big enough. God isn't big enough to take me beyond what I'm comfortable with so that I can experience the need for purity. It is innately in us to want to be pure. When a child is very small, they learn at an early age whether there's consequences for their choices. We live in a culture where we're afraid of discipline and correction because of some secular humanistic psychology world that tells us that their self-esteem is more important than anything. Oh, no, no, no. I know that's a hard pill to swallow, but at the end of the day, I need to find my esteem in God, not in me. I need to believe as I grow up and become an adult that I have to reverence and respect some things that I don't agree with or I am not comfortable with in order for me to feel pure. That need to be pure is very important. When the prophet Isaiah went before God, he said, Woe is me, I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. God, I can't do anything for you as long as I sense this impurity in me. It's why people run away from church. This is why they want run away from sacred veneration. When we venerate the cross, when we venerate an icon, when we come for a blessing after church, if, if we even care, if we even care that we need one. Because when I'm an idolater, I don't need to venerate myself to anybody or anything. I don't need to follow anybody anywhere. Yet, at the end of the day, even St. Mary knew somebody was going to have to bury her. Somebody has to birth you. Someone has to bury you. How can you say you're exempt from having to reverence? It, look at our elders. Uh, when, pe when people get old, they get different. I'm different. The older I get, have, have, have you noticed that? that? Even when like Alzheimer's sets in. Amen. And you know what we do? You can't, you're not supposed to correct an elder. You're not supposed to correct your elders. But we grow up in a society where our kids will say, no, I'm not doing that. I don't have to. I don't want to. You don't what? You don't want to? Okay, I accept you don't want to, but you're going to. Not because I have to flex my authoritarian muscles. It's because I want you to grow up with the favor of God on your life. And so reverence is something that has been eradicated from the church. Our lives and culture epitomize irreverence, casualness, and commonality with God. And it filters down in our home. Wives will talk about their husbands to their children. Husbands will belittle their wives to their buddies. There's no reverence. Why? Because we become common with the feeling of impurity. It's okay to feel impure now. Now impurity becomes normal. When the very innate... See, I'm going to tell you, drug addiction is tied to comfortability with impurity. Perversion. 
Perversion is a comfortability with impurity. I just, I, I, per, I have to pervert the grace of God so that I can stay comfortable with my impurity. I know I'm in trouble today. i got to kiss the altar because here's the problem. The grace of God does not change us. I cannot stay in an impure state like Mary of Egypt who went to the door and said, I cannot go. A force is holding me back. It doesn't matter what any of us have done up until this moment today, last night, or yesterday. But the move of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to us the sense of uncleanliness so that we can activate our will to receive the grace of God to assist us in changing. The grace of God has appeared to all men that they may learn to say no to ungodliness. But see, when we get comfortable with impurity, when we get comfortable with irreverence, we become hostile and paranoid of being controlled by others. See, God is so big. You know, the psalmist cried out, wash me thoroughly of my iniquity and purify me from my sin." There's this calling. Angry people, I believe this, anger escalates as a result of irreverence. And irreverence is not trusting God to correct anything that could harm me. Do you believe God could correct anything that would harm you? Now, but, but we have this world now where we set up our own boundaries of protection. Uh, where well, we even teach it. You, know, you need to put boundaries around you to protect you. No, my boundary is God because there's no longer I that live but God. I want God to go before me. If I have a business deal, I want God to go before me and set things in order. I don't need to fix it. If I'm supposed to be somewhere, I'll be there. If I'm, not, if I'm supposed to have something, I'll have it. But what's more important is I can have something I desire and try to enjoy it with impurity. This is why there's no joy in the church. This is why we have to play secular music to attract people. This is why we have to dumb down the message and say everybody's going to be blessed and prosper if you follow God. No, you're going to end up sometimes like Mary in the desert, scorched and black with with a dependency on God. This woman lived 47 years on three loaves of bread. And you're worried about whether you're going to pay your bills next month? It's disrespectful to God. It's disrespectful of God to become idolatrous to the point that my energy is consumed by my financial security. Or by my popularity. Oh, Lord. I need to calm down. Because, look, if we're going to be this size of church, we might as well go all the way in and be a true church. We might as well see lives start to change because you know what? I got a great grandson. I got grandchildren. I got a gra- great granddaughter. Grand- I got children who are going to have children. We need to learn that repentance, reverence, and respect are a part of the Christian life. When we feel impure, Thank you, Holy Ghost. We don't want anybody close. We don't want to let them in. The lack of, 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 of vulnerability, the lack of vulnerability is a sign of irreverent lack of repentance. I don't know if any of you have been reading the blogs I've been writing. I thought to myself, we're... 
You know, what piece of the pie is preached about repentance in our world? What sliver of the pie? How big is that sliver in the pie of promises, blessings? It's a, it's a tall, slimy sliver because at the heart of repentance is the, is the will. It's the will. It's a connection. And so we have to watch out because really what we need to repent from is not specific sins as much as from idolatry. And idolatry is putting my trust in non-ultimate things. Having an affection and a drive with non-ultimate things. Most of us think that idolatry is the worship of some false god. Idolatry involves placing something non-ultimate at the center of our lives. See, we will put Christianity on the fringe, but it's not at the center. Our lifestyle, our home, our job, everything else is at the center, but what's on the fringe should be at the center, and what's at the center should be on the fringe. Quiet. We need to re- embrace this because, not because you need to be rebuked or corrected, I'm trying to give you the pathway to peace. See, I can go to a job I don't care about, and when I'm reverent and when I am repentive, I'm at peace with it. I don't, I'm not tense. I'm not uptight about it. I thank God this is the provision you want me to have. Like Mother Mary, I may have to walk in the desert, be scorched, but you will stretch this out into my good. But if I'm an idolater, I'll quit and start everything new trying to deal with my unwillingness to deal with my impurity. So now i got to justify it. By displacing my unhappiness and displacing my fears outside of the root cause of them, which is an unrepentant, irreverent life. Ironically, our adultery can be identified in our fears. You want to know what what you're worshiping outside of God? It's the stuff you fear. Because fear leads to worship. And what you fear, you worship. And I know we don't like to preach now, you should fear God. Because he's our buddy. He's our pal. And I say that with tongue in cheek. So nobody misconstrues it. But oh no, fear God? If you can fear God, you know, I realize something. That when you are aware of your carnality... You, re- you recognize the need to repent, but you also recognize the forgiveness of God. You can't have one without the other. If you don't recognize repentance, you can't recognize forgiveness. Or you can't experience it. That's why in our faith we have absolution. Well, I don't want to confess to a man. You know why? Because you're not ready to be cleansed from your impurity yet. Because you want to deal with this in an idolatrous way, your own self. And this is why the protesting world of Christianity says you don't need the sacraments at that level. Let me tell you something. There's something about repenting openly and receiving forgiveness that cleanses us. Well, what if the priest tells somebody about my sin? God will protect you, I guess. People are already making up lies about you anyway. Why panic? (laughs) Why panic? In fact, I'll tell you what. I can trust somebody who is forgiven of of an extraordinary bad sin. I can trust a repentant person. You know, you can trust somebody who's forgiven you. Huh? It's hard to trust if you've never experienced forgiveness. 
Oh, that's deep. I'm going to take you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is that sometimes, see, I'm not sure everybody who says they love somebody really loves them. They love them as long as they don't have to go to a place where they would have to forgive them. I mean, I can love you as long as you're doing the right thing. As long as you're on my team and doing what I want to do, and as long as you don't transgress me in any way, I love you, brother. The most abused cliche in America, I love you, bro. What? You don't love until you face the transgression that requires God to forgive at a level that is beyond normalcy. I promised I wasn't going to preach loud today. I can't help who I am. You think I just made this up? I've lived this. The Bible said today that he who's in the dark stumbles. What is darkness? It's a state of impurity. Uh, look, yes, let me make this clear. Jesus has put all our sins under the blood. In his eyes, we see Jesus. As, he sees Jesus when he sees us. We are in the spirit. But let me tell you something. That innate virus I talked about last week that was, that's in Talon and all of us. We're still dealing with a carnal body, with a carnal mind, a carnal being. And idolatry, I'm going to get ready to finish now. Idolatry is what we need to repent of. Elevating non-ultimate things, non-eternal things to a kind of sacred status in our life where it becomes the object of our devotion. Devotion is not an emotion. When I say devoted to something, I'm talking about what you will choose prioritarily. What you will put at priority is devotion. It's not what you feel because we can all say, I'm just devoted to God, I love God. No, 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 that's not devotion. Devotion is what is the priority, what's at the center and what's on the fringe. What's at the center? And we are battling a culture that is anti-counter to that statement right there. Because we will say we love God, but let alternative voices demand our time or our commitment. And guess what? We transfer the object of our devotion. It has been suggested when we examine sin closely... Invariably, it turns out to be a form of idolatry in that sense. The sense of not being cleansed. And secondly, not sensing being cleansed. You know what? If I transgress Father Anthony, he can say, I forgive you, Bishop. I don't need to hear that he forgave me. I need to experience it. None of us want to hear we're forgiven. We want to experience the sensation of being forgiven. There are people all watching over here and all across the country. They're still holding ought from years and years and years ago, like the deacon has said, back to childhood and stuff. They, the, you know, it's hard to live that way in insanity. It's hard to stay sane. On this Sunday of the Feast of Mary of Egypt, she, she admitted, obviously, to Abba uh, Zosimus, she admitted to him, I had sex not because I needed the money. I had sex with men because I liked it. Because I liked it. That's repentance. It didn't say, well, I, I'm addicted because you don't know what I'm going through. Or I cheated because you don't know how hard it is. No, I, here's why I liked it. And the minute she admitted it, she was able to encounter God honestly. See, that's the whole thing. It's about being honest. It's honesty. Now, you, you don't have to go buy a microphone and a sound system and tell every person you've ever known in your life every transgression you've ever done. But you need to tell somebody. You need to get it out. You need to let it go. And hear somebody say, your sins are forgiven you. I can't believe I did that. Okay, 
I'm still suffering from the choices I made. Of course you are. But you can suffer feeling cleansed. It's better to suffer feeling cleansed than it is to suffer feeling impure. And when you see people worshiping non-ultimate things, I really believe this, and I'm not, I, I'm telling you what I believe from what I've studied in the ancient Talmud, is this is why God, this is why John the Baptist's first words were, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. The first words of the kingdom, you can't have the kingdom without repentance. And now we're going to design a Christianity where God loves us all, accepts us all. We don't have to do anything. He loves my weakness. He celebrates my weakness. you got to be kidding me. Then why do I need grace to change if he accepts me in an inferior state? Why would I even need to preach the grace of God? The grace of God is the power to help me change. So let's set this. Paul said we should not set aside the grace of God and continue in sin. But again, it boils down to this idolatrous way. From a spiritual perspective, the root of all sin is living falsely, representing ourselves in ways that is not true. When we take what does not belong to us, we are pretending that we are entitled to something when in fact we are not. (laughs) We're pretending like we're entitled to it. When we commit adultery, we are living a lie and breaking sacred promises we have made. Lying is the quintessential form of living falsely. I have to, if I lie, I have to live falsely. Lying is a sign I'm living falsely, which is a sign I need cleansing, which is a sign I need to repent so that I can receive forgiveness and then feel cleansed and walk through my life free. Well, I feel I've... Are you following me? This thing about... Mother Mary of Egypt is a, such a powerful thing. Such a powerful thing because it was a total abandonment from her debauchery to her devotion to God. See, we want to hold on to the pieces, pieces of it that still we think makes us feel secure, but in fact, It's just pretending. And we need each other. I believe that with all that's in my heart, is that we make disciples, we help each other through that process. Sin then is about pretending that something is true when it is not. I gotta go into debt to drive a certain kind of car so that strangers think I am something that I'm not. I got to buy 8,000 pairs of shoes and 25 belts and 90 suits to pretend to be something I'm not. And then I wonder why I can't pay my tithes. Which is a sacred declaration. It's a declaration that I am not an idolater. When I bring my tithe, I'm saying I'm not an idolater. I'm not an idolater. But if I feel impure, I can justify it. Because I can say things like, I can't afford to do it. I might get evicted. That's because you don't trust God is bigger than the pretending. I love you. Pray for me. Pray for me. You're looking in some ways at what's left, what's left from idolatry. There are still tentacles and remnants of the charismatic movement and the casual flow in all of us. There's still these remnants like, oh, don't let it get too quiet or too solemn. Don't let it get too convicting. Let's charge it up some way 
so that we don't have to feel that too much. Because we're not comfortable with conviction. We're not comfortable with conviction because we're not supposed to be comfortable with conviction. So to avoid the discomfort of conviction, we create commonness. Commonness. And we walk, we drive onto this property. We all do it. And we walk in here with the contamination and the carnality of this world on us. And God loves us as we walk in. And he sits before us in the sacred mysteries, loving us. And his heart's cry is what the epistle said today. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Let me say something to you. Anyone who would reject you for honestly repenting for your sin can never love you anyway. If you're really in a place of love, there's nothing you cannot lay on the table that won't be forgiven because we've all stumbled and we all in thought, word, and deed have transgressed our God and each other. Idolatry. We need to repent of it. You can even make religion an idolatry, idolatry, a form of idolatry. Stand to your feet with me this morning, beloved. I know this is a cutting to the heart message. But you know what? It's the message that will allow us to begin to change. When we honor the truth about ourselves, listen to this. When we honor the truth about ourselves, Embrace it and avoid any attempt to alter it in order to elevate ourselves above others or make ourselves better than we really are. We are living with integrity and impurity. That is the description of truthful living. Repentance, turning away from sin, is all about choosing God over idolatry. Truth over deception, including self-deception. Now, here's all that's required, beloved, a fearless, unwavering commitment to truth. And that's where I want to get today. A commitment to truth. I'm 60 years old. I can pretend to be 35 if I want to. I can buy a car, dye my hair, go get a spray tan, go buy some hip clothes, but I'm just pretending. I'm pretending to be something. I'm not. Now, I've used a very shallow example. There's deeper issues. The desire to be rich, quit trying to pretend you're rich. Quit trying to play rich. The Bible says, warn the rich of their idolatry. Are you here? God is big enough to care for us right where we're at. So bow your heads. I'm going to pray for you. And for me, Father, teach us to fearlessly and courageously embrace the truth. Deliver us from the need to show devotion to non-ultimate things in order to gain acceptance from people who are not even a part of the process of our eternal calling. Lord, we pray for all men 
We serve all men. Teach us, Lord, reverence. Teach us to reverence things and people that you have said over us even when we don't understand it. In humility, Lord, teach us. The favor comes from reverence, not from arrogance and self-centered promotion. And Lord, I know you're raising up a generation that are not crying out for non-commitment, no responsibility, no accountability, Christianity, but the message of repentance. We embrace it humbly and lovingly knowing before whom we stand. When we begin to live our lives as if we stand continually before God, who sees us at all times, then we are ready to assume. We are ready to embrace responsibility for the kingdom of God. I bless you all now to experience in the rest of this service the beauty of reverence for the sacred mysteries, the beauty of order that bathes our carnality with divinity in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God. I believe in one God. Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, together with the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge